Welcome back, folks, to another edition of Speech Processing. In this video, we'll look at dialogue and conversation and agents. So discourse, dialogue, conversation, right? There's a goal-oriented interaction between two or more participants, right? There's turn-taking, comprehension production, and there's often heavy use of real-world knowledge and contextualized knowledge, like information, like, you know, if we're talking, if I'm talking to you and there's someone over there, I say that person over there, that's shared information that we can, that I can use, that can rely on to communicate, right? Situational information, contextual information. Also beliefs, cultural beliefs, cultural metaphors, right, can be part of conversation and, and just kind of shared knowledge. There can be agendas like goals, right? <clears throat> And also back channeling, like, you know, mm hmm, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, right. All that type of stuff is an important part of dialogue um, and acknowledging what's being said. And personal, cultural, and language specific strategies, right? There, if you learn a second language, uh, you probably have noticed different cultural, linguistic, um, interactional differences, strategies. And so all those go into discourse and conversation and dialogue. Dialogue analysis and design. Well, if we analyze dialogues, there's turn taking, there's linguistic content, there are pauses, right? There's blinking and eye gaze uh, that can vary by individual, right? Or even, even cultural differences, right? Um, there are different uses of dialogue, right? Appointment scheduling, conference registration, travel plans, making a reservation, or stuff like that. And there are corpora that have interaction Right, it's, it's a corpus of conversation and interaction between two or more people. Uh, I have one here from the LDC, not a list speaker characterization. Um, is developed at Technical University of Berlin, composed of 155 hours of conversational speech between 300 German speakers. Awesome. Um, and these can be used in different, these have been used, these corpora right, are used to train different conversational systems. I have a couple links there. And this is an active area of research, um, right, with chatbots, chatterbots or chatbots, right, where you call into a company and you you arrive at a phone tree, you know, an automated system first, and then it routes your call to the, the appropriate human. Or sometimes you don't have to interact with the human at all, right? <clears throat> okay. So here's an example of some turn taking uh, in uh, a corpus of German, right? Here we have glosses in English, right? Hello, Mr. Sch Schlitz. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, sorry. Um, hello, Mrs. Klein. We should arrange an appointment for the team. Good. Uptake. And they give annotations on like what's happening. Like this is uptake, suggestion, supportive, right? And so they're annotating what's happening in the dialogue, the turn taking in and the, the different kind of speech acts. There are quite a few annotated dialogue corporate out there. Um, switchboard, as well as call friend, call home, are, um, excuse me, are corpora of telephone conversations. And there are quite a few out there. The bottom right of my screen right now shows uh, a segment a fragment from the switchboard corpus. So you can see speaker A and B are having a, a conversation here. Speaker A says, so do you go to college now? And speaker A says, are you? And then stops and the speaker B says, yeah. Speaker B, it's my last year, laughter. And so the second column here, the dialogue act is, is just simply labeling what the dialogue act is or the, the speech act there, okay. Uh, I think I mentioned the call home, call friend. Let me just real quick look at the call home. If you just search for call home, one word in the search, you'll see that this uh, there's a lot of call home corpora in different languages. Um, these are people in the U.S. calling home, calling to those different countries outside the U.S. Uh, in different languages. <clears throat> and um, there's kind of updated ones as well. They're newer than the, the original call home. But um, anyway, so a lot of corpora out there with dialogue and conversation. TalkBank is another big corpus of speech, right? Created at, uh, by Brian McWinney at Carnegie Mellon University. A lot of stuff happens, uh, a lot of data is here, including child, child's, child language uh, banks there. 
but they have uh, aphasia, speech of aphasia, speech of dementia patients uh, or um, people, bilingual, uh, corpora, gesture and tutorials, etc. So all sorts of speech, especially interaction between two people. And uh, like I mentioned, some clinical, some clinical things. Okay. So conversational agents or dialogue agents, right? We know these as, hey Siri, let's see if it reacted. It did react, just listen to me right now. Hey Siri. I aim to please. <laughs> she said I aim to please, well, that's really nice, Siri. Um, Alexa, right, Amazon's Alexa or Google Assistant, right? Um, these are voice enabled bots or, you know, assistants, right? That carry on a dialogue or a conversation with the users. There are also voice enabled vehicles. There's human robot interaction and that can be used for like clinical uses or, or medical uses, even um, mental health applications. Uh, consumer interfaces, like I mentioned, calling into a company and getting a, a, a chat bot, you know, on the phone to get it routed to someone, to an actual human. <coughs> Excuse me. There can be tutorial instructions that are um, done through an uh, interactive conversational agent between a human and uh, the uh, agent. Right. A little bit about the history. Well, conversational interfaces and dialogue systems right, have been around um, for a while um, now. And you can have professional animators that manually synthesize conversational behaviors for animated figures. Right, these are kind of like hardwired facial expressions and whatnot. There can be rule governed, autonomous generation of verbal and nonverbal conversational behavior. And there can be um, also like fully automated um, generation of both the speech as well as um, if it's a robot, any facial um, movements. Okay. And these are often used for like training machine learning systems. Um, these big speech corpora and video corpora are used uh, for training machine learning systems. So here's a little diagram. It's kind of a, a high-level diagram of basic discourse production. You have some goal, some discourse goal, like I need to do this, I need to make a reservation. And you have some knowledge base that goes into a text planning component, um, and that's influenced by the user model, a model that that kind of simulates or, or models, that is, a user, a human, interacting with this thing. And uh, you have a discourse plan. Also, discourse history can influence what's said next. Um, and it comes down to a natural language text, right? That can be put into like a TTS system that is um, spoken. Here's another kind of high level dialogue or diagram of dialogue, human, computer human interaction. Right, we have the human and the computer um, comprehending each other, dialoguing and generating, going back and forth, right? And that's some really high level um, graphic there. Uh, interaction and initiative. So a system-based uh, is usually the, the system is initiating communication with the user. It's like if you call into a company, it'll say, what do you want to do? Are you here, you know, tell me why you're, you know, it's, it's in initiating the communication and it's getting information from you to route your call to the right person. The user responds, and there's usually one discourse term per participant, not very personable and nor natural. You can have user-based, on the right-hand side of this slide, user-based systems where the user initiates communication and the system responds. It's so like maybe you're asking questions. It's like a general purpose um, system or general knowledge system. There's a potential for engaging or even alienating the user. There can be a mixed way at the bottom part of the screen. There can be a mixed system where each user takes a turn and relinquish, relinquishes initiative, and this is much more natural and complicated to manage. <clears throat> state of the art or states of the art in dialogue management, it's using a, it's using a, a hidden Markov model, a finite state machine that has hard-coded solution, domain specific, that they're best if it's domain specific, like in some, you know, um, closed set of vocabulary you're trying to get through uh, a dialogue system to get to a human, right? That type of thing. Um, there can be belief, desire, intention architectures that try and build in 
belief and desire and, and the goal. And those do a better, uh, have a better representation of dialogue flow. And also the conversational record can be recorded. Um, there's a system called Dialogue Move Engine that um, does that. And uh, there are frame-based systems where you have handwritten rules and machine learning classifiers to fill slots. And like I mentioned, Dialogue Move um, Engine is another type of uh, system to do dialogue with the computer. And there could be machine learning involved there, as well as cognitive modeling, trying to, to model human cognition. Here is a wild um, graphic that the, the lines are a little bit messed up there, but let's say we start here at the top, at the top of the screen, we have um, this interaction with an agent. And we have Eagle 6, this is 1-6. The situation here is growing more serious. We spot a weapons in the crowd over. And then we get a response back. Anyway, so this is uh, like a training module where uh, perhaps uh, a, a military situation, you have like the base and you have a sergeant out in the field uh, communicating with each other. And so uh, a dialogue system like this can be used to train the humans on how to um, interact in this, this situation where there's um, crowd problems. And actually I have a, a yeah, right here, next um, slide is this sample of a mission rehearsal exercise where military people, um, military personnel are rehearsing what might happen in the field. So for example, if soldiers are kind of pushed into becoming peacekeepers, and if there's a situation where, for example, a, a boy is, is struck by a car and the peacekeepers come to help and then people start gathering around and thinking that the military is somehow responsible for this, this accident, and how to deal with that that situation where the mother's screaming and anyway, so all this kind of real life stuff can be um, simulated through a dialogue system that the humans train with in order to be more prepared when they get into the field and encounter something like this. That's what this is getting at here. In fact, a, a BYU uh, student who was in this class, speech processing, did the speech modeling for this this particular system here that we're looking at, the screenshot we're looking at. So, modeling the state, well, you have shared knowledge, common knowledge, like I mentioned, and you wanna model the user, the participant, to some degree. You also wanna model affect, that is like fear and anger and mistrust, like emotions, human emotions, if you can. Um, you can, and it takes work to do so. <clears throat> and that creates a more natural round trip dialogue, like back and forth between the human and the agent, the, the computer system. And this, um, the context reduces ambiguity, so taking the context, taking into account the context is important. Here's a system that was built here at BYU um, called the SOAR Dialogue Comprehension Generation System. Um, basically, the idea is that you can create these recipes like for certain domains and use these recipes to perform some interaction with speech with a, with a human uh, between a human and an agent and you can choose the the appropriate one the appropriate recipe depending on the situation <clears throat> excuse me here's another kind of high level um, diagram so the top part we have a human agent right and we can use um, ASR an ASR system to bring in you know, to synthesize, or not synthesize, but to bring the speech as text and then put that into an uh, off-board computer that's more robust, that can do comprehension and dialogue and generation, and then push that through to a TTS system back to the human. Or um, they, here at BYU, Dr. Lonsdale headed up this, this project um, in which they had two computer agents talking to each other through language, through human spoken language using TTS and ARSR systems and their off-board um, kind of bigger, more robust computers that were doing the dialogue and the comprehension, the dialogue and the generation of the dialogue back and forth with each other. Um, here's another kind of high level on the top right of the screen. Um, again, we've, if you can build in beliefs and desires into a system and intentions, and it makes for more natural um, interaction with the computer.
So dialog move engines are computer systems, usually agents that explicitly manage dialogs. And so again, having um, common ground or beliefs and culture somewhat shared, it can make for a better experience for the human interacting with such a system. <clears throat> Here's one system called GoDis that has a central controller that has the input and the interpretation going on the left-hand side. And then um, on the right-hand side, we have generation output. And on the middle, we have like the knowledge base, like the database and the lexicon, the domain knowledge about the specific task at hand and how those uh, come together to create um, what is what the, the agent gives back to the human. And this um, figure on the right is a kind of a, the same idea with this dialog move engine in the middle with its input and interpretation on the left and the generation output on the right with these different um, knowledge bases around um, history and culture that can go into creating a um, more human-like agent with the central controller at the top. You can see that these lines are a little bit messed up. Here's some sample systems for Dialog, uh, Google's Dialog Flow. Um, it, it's right here. It says lifelike conversational AI with state of the art virtual agents available in two editions. Those editions, it is a, you can try it for free. Uh, it, is a, it is a paid service. Uh, Microsoft Azure has a system, a dialog system. Uh, Dialogues as conversational building blocks in Composer. Awesome. Dialog types, different things you can do with their system. Amazon Lex has a system. What is Amazon Lex two, V2? Uh, it's building conversational interfaces for applications using voice and text. Yep. Okay. Uh, IBM Watson. Um, you may or may not remember or heard that um, IBM built this computer called Watson that took on two Jeopardy champions 15 years ago, give or take at this point, 12 to 15 years ago. Um, anyway, here's a short video kind of describing. Uh, it's more focused on the engineers that built um, the system, built Watson. I remember that morning, but, last um, choice. Let's take alternate meanings for 200, Alex. Four letter word for a vantage point or a belief. Brad. What is a view? Yes. After the first clue of the game, which anyway. was as good. What is you? You are right. We actually took. Anyway, it shows that their computer system crushed the, uh, the humans, the best champions. One of which is a BYU alum. One of those guys on that show is a BYU alum. He, uh, you may or may not know him, but he, uh, after Jeopardy changed their rule that you could, a, a person could keep going, like basically indefinitely. Uh, before that point, you could only go five days, five wins, and then you had to, you know, relinquish your your spot on the show. But after they changed that rule, a BYU alum went like 70 plus days, I think it was, and won like two or $3 million. Um, just crushing uh, Jeopardy questions. And then uh, IBM built this system and uh, it crushed the humans. Um, <clears throat> Nuance has, a, has one as well here. You can take a look at that. So most have a free tier like I <clears throat> showed. Most have a free tier. And, um, but it is usually a, pay, a paid subscription service that you just simply go to their API. I keep clicking, I don't mean to click. Um, and uh, you just, it's an API system. There are lots of open source uh, toolkits and GoDist right there, Open Dialog, uh, Conversation Lab or Conv Lab 3 is a flexible dialog system platform based on a unified data format for task oriented dialog sets. Cool. So there are open source systems, uh, toolkits out there. So what is an agent? Well, it's an autonomous goal oriented process and it's aware that it's in and reacts to its environment and it cooperates with other agents, like whether it's human or software to accomplish tasks or to try and get to the goal. Um, so there are software intelligent agents and there are people. These are agents, right? We are agents in a, a gospel sense, right? Um, we know that we are agents and that we choose what we want to do. And so they can, you can simulate that idea with, with software, create a software agent, an intelligent agent. 
So why use an agent? Well, to it uh, exists to do the bidding of human users and represent it represents human users in computational uh, things and computational environment. And um, it can use both verbal and nonverbal devices to advance and regulate the dialogue between the user and the computer. It adds a human dimension to the computer system. Um, it reduces, requires fewer scenario development resources. It makes learning more interactive, more lively. This can have application for like children with autism who don't like to look at humans in the eye, but may look at like a robot that's talking to it more in the eye and pay more attention to to um, the robot. I think I have a picture in a couple slides about that. Embodied conversational agents. Well, you have like cartoon, you can have cartoon characters that have human properties in the face-to-face -face conversation. And some of the most recent state-of-the-art um, animations of human faces are really good. Like it's, it's surprising how good it is. I'll um, pull up a, a video here in a minute uh, from USC, University of Southern California. Um, but they can produce and respond to both verbal and nonverbal input and output. Um, and they use conversational functions such as turn taking and feedback. And the graphics are not just pretty pictures, but can convey uh, meaning with the facial expressions that are, are made. Um, I'll show you that. In, an example here. Here's some early noteworthy agents or notable agents. University of Pennsylvania had Jack, and it was in a 3D interactive environment for controlling animated uh, articulated features and had behavioral controls. Uh, USC's, University, University of Southern California's Steve uh, was a training agent for virtual environments like the submarine, nuclear submarine engine room. This picture down here at the bottom part of my screen, this, um, this um, the picture on the left here, he's in this nuclear submarine engine room and training the person, the human, on how to, to do things, how to um, turn the knobs and how far to turn the knobs. You go 45 degrees to the left, and if you reach for the wrong knob, like they have eye tracking technology that shows, that tracks the, the human's uh, eye gaze, and if the human is looking at the wrong knob, um, then, the, per then the, the, the agent says, no, that's the wrong knob, it's this one over here. So it's, it's used for training in situations where you can't train a new person to go into a nuclear submarine engine room and make mistakes. Um, so that's one application of, of these agents. This MIT RIA real estate agent, virtual real estate agent, uh, the, the right picture on the bottom part of my screen here uh, was the real estate agent um, that she could show houses. There are others here. Adele was a nursing train, a nurse trainer. Um, Baldi uh, also taught or uh, gave linguistically detailed pronunciations. <clears throat> so the immersive conversational environments at USC's, University of Southern California's, uh, this is their uh, Institute for Creative Technologies. They have all sorts of really fascinating videos. The future is virtual, augmented. Um, about using, creating agents for various applications. Let's see if I can get one real quick. Here's a virtual human toolkit. They have different humans that, different human agents. Let me just play a little bit. humans for over a decade. The USC Institute for Creative Technologies has been developing virtual humans for over a decade. Now, with the virtual human toolkit, you can make your own. First, you select a character from. Anyway, let's see, watch, watch the rest of that if you like. They have different. Um, Kind of prototypes or templates here. Um, Brave Mind, this virtual reality exposure therapy. Like this was built to help soldiers with um, veterans with PTSD um, get some therapy. We have these different applications. This is these are uh, agents here, software agents, right? That uh, have specific tasks or, or do specific things with the humans. Quite a few out there that they have. Um, this one here was interesting. What happens when the last Holocaust survivor dies? This one. Who will tell their story? And is there a way to be remembered forever? Do you think you were brave during the Holocaust? I don't look at it that way. I look at it as maybe being selfish because I wanted to live while everybody. So this is really interesting. In this particular project, the Shoah, 
um, they took Holocaust survivors and um, all the information they can get about them, like diaries and things, and created a system that created a, a hologram that you could interact with and um, ask questions about their life and what they learned. <clears throat> so it's an interesting uh, way of, of preserving history in this this human agent where a human can interact with this basically computer that's in the form of a hologram. Um, so it's a really cool application of all sorts of technologies that we've seen. ASR, and the comprehension, the dialogue component, and then the TTS to talk back to the human, and then this whole different component of this hologram, right, uh, which we're not looking at at all. Anyway, you should take a look at some of these uh, links I have here. What is this one here again? Oh yeah, NVIDIA. Oh yeah, look how realistic that face looks. I mean, let me zoom in like this. That's that's software as computer generated. And it looks quite realistic. Uh, this, yeah, that's computer generated. Anyway, <clears throat> take a look at some of those. Oh yeah, hum humanoid robots. I showed you. Uh, I think it was last or the last uh, lecture, or the previous one. Um, Sophia the robot sang a duet with um, Jimmy Fallon, right? And so here's some other humanoid robots uh, videos about. Oh, that's Sophia right there herself. So you can look at that one if you like. Um, again, but all he can do is move his head. His brain, a mesh of wires connected to a computer. Hi, Philip. My name is Chad. Hello, Chad. Let's chat. And yeah, you can see this came out. What would that be? That would be in, in 2012, looking at the year of publication of this video. So that one's kind of dated already. You can, the, the voice itself sounds pretty, pretty um, dated. This is interesting. This is a Japanese robot who, I mean, that, that right there is a robot. I mean, I'm just kind of zoomed out, but I'll let you guys look at these videos uh, about humanoid robots and um, their abilities. There's this interesting project from Microsoft, the deceased person chatbot, chatbot that tries to revive a loved one who has died um, by creating uh, a chatbot. Transportation, there can be, there's autonomous like self-driving vehicles, right, and drones, airplanes uh, these days, even autonomous fighter jets. Um, and so having created a, a computer system that creates that has an agent in it that's controlling the vehicle, whether it's a, a truck or a Humvee or some drone, right, to make decisions based on the input that it has. It's trying to model human cognition, right? Um, so. There are healthcare applications here, like I mentioned, um, the top right of this top right of this uh, of this group of pictures. We have this autistic uh, boy interacting with this robot, and, and and he's able to interact with this robot better than with humans. And so you can you know get get uh, teach him through this this robot. Um, IBM's Watson. There are other type of uh, different uh, applications for healthcare. Cognitive robotics and humanoid platforms. There's several. Of this uh, I'll let you click through those, but um, I'll just click on this first one real quick. This is in Italy, I believe. Yeah, iCub is a research-grade humanoid robot designed to help develop to help developing and testing embodied AI algorithms. Awesome. There's some ethical issues, right? Um, there can be developer biased. Um, systems, right? The, the, the bias of the developer can make its way into a system. There can be offensive language, right? And, and hate speech, depending on what corpus is used. Like if you were to train um, a bot on Reddit, you know, language, you're probably going to get foul language and rudeness and stuff, right? And in fact, um, there's this, <laughs> this uh, chat bot that Microsoft released, I think in 2016, that they had to take down after 16 hours because of, um, here, let's see. Tay was an artificial intelligence chat box that was originally released by Microsoft in 2016. It caused um, 
It caused subsequent controversy when the bot began to post inflammatory and offensive tweets through its Twitter account, causing Microsoft to shut down the service only 16 hours after its launch. Uh, according to Microsoft, this was caused by trolls who attacked the service as the bot made replies based on its interactions with people on Twitter. Anyway, so there can be ethical, ethical issues, right? Um, if you, it just depends on what, how it's trained and how it, um, right? So if it's trained on bad language, it's gonna use bad language. Um, also, you wouldn't want to have it record sensitive information. Um, there can be gender stereotypes that come through from actual human language that come through, you know, to to the bot, and so the bot will come across as as um, sexist or, or you know um, racist you know, as well. Uh, there's a system created here at BYU, uh, the Source system. And it was a cognitive modeling system that was um, used in many different applications. And um, this quiz um, system here was created by uh, Dr. Lonsdale, our computational linguist. Uh, it was a quiz system to quiz you on your own genealogy. So it would take the JEDCOM sys uh, files and make a database, and then it would use Baldi, this uh, conversational agent, to uh, and use the dialog move engine here, and it also had uh, access to external knowledge sources like history and stuff, and it would quiz you, or you could ask questions about your own genealogy to it, and it would give you the answer. So, for example, here's some questions that um, Dr. Lonsdale uh, asked the question or asked uh, the system, or or was asked by the system about his own genealogy. There can be L2 applications with these um, dialog systems. And um, for example, how, teaching ELC, uh, English Language Center students here at BYU, how to buy a, a ticket, like a, a airline ticket or a bus ticket. You know, you're talking about days of the week and, and destinations and different type of uh, ways of communicating, like I need to buy a bus ticket versus I like to buy a bus ticket. Um, so using a a dialog system can help L2 learners of a language learn how to do domain-specific or task-specific exercises. Here is a gnarly graphic about this system to buy a ticket that was used here at BYU in the English Language Center um, that was built by um, people here at BYU. And each of these nodes, I don't need to get into the details, but each of these nodes is, is a conversational um, component. Like you start here at the top left of the graphic, you come down and, and you make your way through the, the system to buy a ticket. So just to summarize, dialogue systems are cool um, and are used in a lot of applications. And so the task for this, this next task is to simply get one of the dialogue systems working. I have links to several there, or if you simply Google dialogue system, you know, you can probably find others, but I have some links um, on the, uh, the lab. So anyway, that's it. See you next time.